You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Corbett Report podcast. I am your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan. Today is the 26th of August, 2014, which is a Tuesday. This podcast is supposed to be released on Mondays, but just like last week, this podcast is so chock full of information that I needed an extra day to put it all together and make it ready for you. So I hope you appreciate it. This is going to be a pretty powerful presentation, or at least it is intended to be so, and if it fails in that quest, the fault is all mine. But the praise, at least partially, needs to go to not only myself, but members of the CorbettReport.com community. For those of you out there who don't know, the CorbettReport.com website has been expanding its open source investigation as, of course, Corbett Report members, i.e. people who are paid subscribers to CorbettReport.com for as little as $1 a month, 100 Japanese yen a month, get access to the website to start leaving comments on the website. And as a result of that, we've opened up a few open source investigations, including last week's open source investigation on Ebola and this week's open source investigation, which is now a, well, a month plus in uh, in preparation. And that open source investigation now has upwards of 100 different members commenting, uh, over 250 comments, an incredible amount of links and information, people parsing this information there on the website. So it is a a great and valuable and growing resource for people out there who are interested in basically what's going on and trying to keep up with the story. My hat's off to all of the Corbett Report members who are contributing to that conversation and who have contributed to it. On today's subject, which is going to be, of course, MH17, the downed Boeing 777, the Malaysia Airlines flight that crashed in eastern Ukraine last month. But before we get into that, I want to thank some of the members of that CorbettReport.com community specifically. And here I'm talking about username Spoonful, username Green Crow, as well as Gwen and Derek, all of whom helped compile some of the information that went into the backbone of this presentation that you're about to see. And especially my hats off to Sean, who helped not only to prepare this, but to actually make the presentation itself, the file. Despite the fact that he'd never worked with Open Office Impress before, he did an impressive job <laughs> putting this together. So uh, thank you so much to all of those community members who helped out. And also thank you to Jason, Delia, Ian, and Bart, who all offered to help with uh, this, uh, this, the compilation of this podcast slash presentation, but uh, who either couldn't help out at this time or who I actually couldn't get to their email in time to get them included in the project. Again, this just goes to show that there are an incredible amount of people who are contributing to this uh, information and the, the compilation of all of this these details and an incredibly growing and vibrant CorbettReport.com community. It is becoming the type of community that I always hoped it would be. So uh, I'm very, very happy to see that taking place. Uh, slowly but surely, we are transforming this into a truly open source community investigation. So on that note, today, as I say, we're going to turn our attention to MH17. Let's get straight into it. This presentation is entitled Crashes of Convenience, MH17, and is a member of that uh, ongoing podcast series we have on various plane crashes of convenience uh, that includes, for example, PL101 and other plane crashes besides. Of course, those of you watching the YouTube presentation of this uh, podcast will no doubt have noticed the ridiculous, pimply-faced, hyperbolic, hyperventilating title complete with block capitals and multiple exclamation marks that I put on this presentation as a type of parody slash homage to the ridiculous lowest common denominator pl- uh, placating and and uh, gesticulating that's going on in the alternative media, which I think is pretty reprehensible. But hey, if you can't beat them, join them, right? Ha ha ha. Don't worry, I will not uh, t- title future uh, videos in such a way. I just couldn't help but uh, make fun of the ridiculous trend in uh, video titles these days. 
At any rate, this is Crashes of Convenience MH17, and as I say, we're talking about the downed Malaysian Airlines Boeing 777 that crashed in eastern Ukraine last month, specifically on July 17th. And that's an interesting date for MH17, which uh, began operations. Its first flight was July 17th, 1997, meaning that July 17th, 2014 was its 17th birthday uh, of sorts, if a plane has a birthday. This was MH17's 17th birthday on the 17th, and uh, with uh, make of that what you will, and make of this picture what you will. This is the iconic picture of MH17, taken presumably at Schiphol Airport. That's what we're being told. This was taken at Schiphol Airport shortly before it left uh, for its infamous flight, and this was a photograph taken by Yaron Mofaz, and uh, there is uh, very little hard information that I've seen about who Yaron Mofaz is and what his connections may be, but I do have a link that I'll throw in the show notes uh, to, so you can read a little bit more about this Israeli who took this picture and who did not board the plane. He was not one of the passengers of the ill-fated uh, flight, as uh, the other iconic photo of MH17 at Schiphol Airport was. It was taken by uh, Cor Pan, which was a uh, a pseudonym of one of the passengers, Cornelius uh, something or other, the name escapes me at the moment, who was a passenger on the flight who posted that picture to Facebook. This is the other picture, which does not, uh, which looks very, very professional, looks very good, and was picked up by Reuters and widely published. So again, I'll throw the link in the show notes at CorbettReport.com so you can read more about this photo and what's behind it. But let's move on. So the question, of course, as always, what are we going to cover in this presentation? In this presentation, we're going to review, as we usually do, the official story, what we are expected to believe about what really took place last month uh, during the downing of this aircraft. We're going to examine the timeline of MH17. We're going to detail counter evidence to the evidence, quote unquote, that's been proposed by the U.S. State Department and its allies. We're going to debunk some of the lies and rumors surrounding this event, and we're going to hopefully disarm the propaganda. And disarm is the operative word here, because we are definitely dealing with weaponized information. This is information that, of course, we can see was quite clearly intended to further that demonization of Russia towards the creation of increased military tensions between Russia and the Ukraine specifically, and of course, in the broader context, Russia and NATO. And in that regard, it, uh, well, it wasn't exactly a success, as we'll see. It's uh, obviously, the MH17 story has all but disappeared from the news media now that the actual facts of the situation don't quite line up with the propaganda that we were being told. But at any rate, uh, it certainly was effective in getting that further round of sanctions on Russia that uh, have played a part in some of the recent economic turmoil taking place between Europe and Russia specifically, but again, more broadly speak speaking, between the U.S. allies and Russia. So we are, again, at the brink of military tension, which may be easing off as we record this podcast. Uh, Putin is meeting with his Ukrainian counterpart in Germany to uh, begin talks to ease the tensions there in eastern Ukraine. Hopefully, this is a story that within a month or two, we will all have forgotten the craziness going on, going on in Ukraine. But uh, if not, this may be a key point of that story and a key point for, once again, disarming the propaganda, the information war we're being fed. So let's begin by taking a look at that MH17 timeline. And we know, for example, we know that MH17 departed Schiphol Airport at 1014 UTC. All of these times are in UTC. Uh, 1315, uh, 115 p.m., Ukraine ATC loses contact with uh, with the, the aircraft, and that is reported to Malaysian Airlines. Now, the interesting thing is when Malaysian Airlines reported that to the press, they mistakenly declared that was 215 UTC, but it was actually 115 UTC. And then basing this on a... Uh, uh, basing this on... Uh, a timeline that was actually posted in the Star Online, a Malaysian uh, newspaper slash um, online media outlet. They have a timeline which then indicates that the crash presumably took place at 3.30 
uh, UTC, which is an hour and 15 minutes after Ukraine ATC air traffic control loses contact with the plane, which I cannot believe for the life of me. I do not think that, I, I think there has to be a mistake in that timeline. And yet the strangest thing is absolutely nowhere is it recorded that I can find anywhere online exactly what time the craft was downed. I understand there may be some confusion because, uh, again, there, there may be some uh, it's a period of time where it's gone off the radar and they can't track it, and etc. But surely we must know within within a period of several minutes at what point this plane actually crashed, and yet that is not recorded in any of the official timelines that I can find at all. So um, even basic facts like these seem to be still in question. But moving along, at 3.40 p.m. UTC, Interfax and the Ukrainian Interior Ministry confirmed the shootdown confirming all passengers and crew are de were dead on that flight, uh, originally reported as, I believe, 295, but uh, eventually that being upwards of 298. At 4.03 p.m. Uh, UTC, the Ukrainian Prime Minister Yatsenyuk orders an official investigation into the crash, and at 4.18, officials confirm that the, there are at least 100 bodies spread over 15 kilometers at the crash scene. Moving right along, at 6.28 p.m., Interfax reports that uh, separatists have found the black box from the, the crashed uh, airliner, which, of course, will contain the voice data recorder and other important pieces of information that can be used to, uh, to put together what actually occurred in the final few minutes of the ill-fated flight. At 8.15 p.m. UTC, the ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, declares that the route that this was traveling on was a safe route. Um, the IATA comes out to state that the route was not subject to any specific restrictions, which sounds surprising given that this was a war zone in which in the preceding weeks alone, uh, uh, at least a couple of transport planes had been downed by some of the uh, Russian separatists. And yet, this seems to be confirmed by uh, data from Flight Radar 24 that indicates not only Malaysia Airlines was repeatedly flying over Ukraine in the days and weeks preceding uh, Flight 17's downing, but uh, that KLM, Thai Airways, and Lufthansa were also, also all similarly flying directly over Ukraine, with British Airways and Air France diverting flights down south, uh, south of the Black Sea around the, the hot zone there in eastern Ukraine. So uh, apparently this was, if not um, a completely standard flight path, it was not unbelievably unusual uh, c compared to some of the other uh, flight plans flight plans filed and flown by some of the other airways in the at the time of uh, Flight 17's downing. At 11.30 uh, p.m. on July 17th, uh, the Malaysia Airlines confirms that 298 passengers and crew are dead, not 295, as previously reported. Now, this leads us into a July 18th press briefing from the Commander-in-Chief, or uh, the uh, the the decider-in-chief, uh, Barack Obama, who had this statement about the downing of the aircraft. Now, here's what we know so far. The evidence indicates that the plane was shot down by a surface-to-air missile that was launched from an area that is controlled by Russian-backed separatists inside of Ukraine. We also know that this is not the first time a plane has been shot down in eastern Ukraine. Over the last several weeks, Russian-backed separatists have shot down a Ukrainian transport plane and a Ukrainian helicopter, and they claimed responsibility for shooting down a Ukrainian fighter jet. Moreover, we know that these separatists have received a steady flow of support from Russia. This includes arms and training. It includes heavy weapons, and it includes anti-aircraft weapons. Now, here's what must happen now. This was a global tragedy. An Asian airliner was destroyed in European skies, filled with citizens from many countries. So there has to be a credible international investigation into what happened. The UN Security Council has endorsed this investigation, and we will hold all its members, including Russia, to their word in order to facilitate that investigation. Russia, pro-Russian separatists, and Ukraine must adhere to an immediate ceasefire. Evidence must not be tampered with. 
Investigators need to access the crash site and the solemn task of returning those who were lost on board the plane to their loved ones needs to go forward immediately. Now, the United States stands ready to provide any assistance that is necessary. Uh, we've already offered the support of the FBI and the National Transportation Safety Board, which has experience in working with international partners on these types of investigations. Uh, they are on their way, personnel from the FBI and the National Transportation Safety Board. In the coming hours and days, I'll continue to be in close contact with leaders from around the world as we respond to this catastrophe. Our immediate focus will be on recovering those who were lost, investigating exactly what happened, and putting forward the facts. And I want to point out there will likely be misinformation as well. And I think it's very important for folks to sift through what is factually based and what is simply speculation. Well, I think no one could deny that there needs to be a credible, independent international investigation into what took place there, or that there will be misinformation uh, propagated surrounding this event. So I think we have to agree with Obama on those points, although at the very least we would have to, uh, to cock an eyebrow at the idea that the FBI and the National Transportation Safety Board, the same NTSB and FBI that approved the TWA-800 cover-up, would be the ones to conduct such an independent inv investigation. But why listen to me on that point when we can listen to another skeptical voice that came out the same day as Barack Obama was making his statements and the media was beginning to jump on the blame Russia bandwagon with Putin's missile and other such headlines uh, blaring across the European press, we had this note of skepticism coming from Russia Deputy Defense Minister Anatoly Antonov, who gave a press conference in which he raised questions of his own about what actually occurred there on July 17th. Today, uh, there is a very important question. Uh, who is responsible for such uh, tra tragedy and uh, what should we do together to prevent uh, uh, from such accidents? Uh, I'm a little surprised that during 24 hours after this crash, there is a lot of publication and statement by uh, Western officials who try to blame Russian Federation as well as armed forces of Russia uh, and they try to show the whole world that we are responsible for that uh, crash. It's very strange uh, that uh, without real evidences, uh, my colleagues from Western media uh, would like to find somebody who is responsible for this uh, crash. Uh, it seems to me that there is a part of uh, informational warfare which uh, has been started against the Russian Federation and armed forces. Uh, as to me, I don't want to use this opportunity to blame anybody. I just would like to raise a few questions to my uh, uh, colleagues from armed forces of Ukraine. And I hope that if they try an opportunity to answer to our questions, there will be a good opportunity for us to, uh, to realize where we are whether there is a possibility for us to uh, restart uh, cooperation and to find uh, somebody who is responsible, real responsible for such a tragedy. So that would be the other side of the story, and if there was to be anything approaching an independent investigation of what happened, you would think that the Ukrainians would have taken seriously the 10 questions that the Russian Defense Ministry posed to the Ukrainian authorities at that time of that press conference on July 18th. Uh, but, well, those questions were, uh, the answers to those questions were not forthcoming. The questions are documented. I will put them in the show notes so you can read them for yourself, but they include such questions as, can Kiev explain in detail how it uses book missile launchers in the conflict zone, and why were these systems deployed there in the first place, seeing as the self-defense forces don't have any planes? A reasonable question. Uh, why are the Ukrainian authorities not doing anything to set up an international commission? When will such a commission begin its work? Uh, would the Ukrainian armed forces be willing to let international investigators see the inventory of their air-to-air -air and surface-to-air missiles, including those used in SAM launchers? 
Uh, will the International Commission have access to tracking data from reliable sources regarding the movements of Ukrainian warplanes on the day of the tragedy? And why did the Ukrainian air traffic controllers allow the plane to deviate from the regular route to the north towards the anti-terrorist operation zone? A question uh, uh, regarding the derivation, as they say, of the, the flight from its intended flight path by as much as 14 kilometers it uh, it strayed off course, and that was presumably the reason why it was flying over that particular spot where it ultimately ended up going down. Uh, so again, there is some question about how and why it came to divert so uh, so widely from its course, and why the Ukrainian air traffic controllers did not do anything about that. A question that goes to the heart of another one of the interesting parts of this MH17 saga, the fact that the Ukrainian air traffic control communications with MH17 still have not been released, which is pretty far, pretty much unprecedented in, in, in the terms of such a major commercial airliner investigation. But let's continue with the timeline. On July 20th, we have Malaysia Airlines finally releasing the official passenger list of MH17, which will be linked up in the show notes again at CorbettReport.com. Also on the 20th, the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Samantha Power, addressed the U.N. Security Council. On July 21st, you have the black boxes uh, that was that were recovered. The black box that was recovered uh, from a MH17 on July 17th was handed over to Malaysian authorities, and that was the end of a, a, a particularly long and circuitous saga in which the black box was originally going to be handed over to the Russian authorities for examination. And then it was, uh, then Malaysia came in and said, no, it's ours, it belongs to Malaysia Airlines. So it was handed over to them and then immediately sent to London for independent analysis and investigation. And the results of that investigation are pretty interesting, as we'll see in a short while. But also on the 21st of July, we had Russian uh, military holding a press conference with satellite and radar data, bringing up some of the interesting anomalies of MH17's uh, uh, take it, shoot, shoot down, taking down, uh, which we will go into in a uh, short while, but uh, very interesting forensic examination being presented there. Moving ahead in the timeline, uh, moving ahead to August 3rd, we have a classified U.S. intelligence briefing blaming Ukrainian military for the downing of the MH17. This comes to us via Robert Perry of Iran-Contra fame uh, from consortiumnews.com. In an article that he posted up on Consortium News on August 3rd, Flight 17 Shootdown Scenario Shifts. And uh, it starts by saying, contrary to the Obama administration's public claims blaming eastern Ukrainian rebels and Russia for the shootdown of Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, some U.S. intelligence analysts have concluded that the rebels in Russia were likely not at fault and that it appears Ukrainian government forces were to blame, according to a source briefed on these findings. All right, so an interesting little report, and again, take it for what it's worth coming from anonymous officials speaking behind the scenes, but at any rate, it certainly does provide a counterpoint to the official story. August 8th, a very interesting agreement is signed between the MH17 investigating uh, countries uh, that basically classify their findings. And we'll pick this up from a story that was only published in English on August 23rd. We'll take this from globalresearch.ca. The causes of the MH17 crash are classified. Ukraine, Netherlands, Austria, Belgium signed a non-disclosure agreement. This article is translated from the original Russian and reads in part, quote, In the framework of the four-country agreement signed on the 8th of August between Ukraine, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Australia, information on the progress and results of the investigation of the disaster will remain classified. This was confirmed at a briefing in Kiev under the auspices of the Office of the Pro Prosecutor Gen General, Yuri Boychenko. In his words... The results of the investigation will be published once completed only if a consensus agreement of all parties that have signed the agreement prevails. Any one of the signatories has the right to veto the publication of the results of the investigation without explanation. Uh, that's a pretty remarkable agreement to be signed in uh, an investigation, an open investigation into a public event, a public disaster that the public has been... Uh, endlessly fed images and 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 has been paraded before the public as this great outrage 
But now the actual investigation into what happened is effectively classified, and unless there is consensus agreement on the report, it can be vetoed by any of its members. Again, just a bizarre, bizarre finding. And we'll, uh, we'll play out the timeline here. August 19th, Russia addresses the UN Security Council and asks, where are the air traffic control records? A very good question that still still is a question that remains to be answered. Uh, we can pick that up from the event chronicle.com from August 19th. Russia to Ukraine, Kiev must publish record of MH17 communications with traffic control. <coughs> this report reads, Kiev should make the public the records of communications between the Ukrainian air traffic control and the Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 in the, in the hours before it was shot down over Ukraine's turbulent east, Russia's UN envoy said. The issue was among several Russia raised at a UN Security Council meeting, which was called by Russia to discuss the progress of the investigation into the tragic incident, which killed 298 people in July, Vitaly Cherkin said. Uh, Moscow sees the shortage of proper evidence known to the public so far as wrong. As far as we know, UN's civil aviation watchdog, the ICAO, is being kept on the sidelines of the investigation, which has been conducted for some time. Uh, again, pretty remarkable that these, even these basic records are being held back, something that uh, Russia has done its best to bring to the attention of the quote-unquote international community, but because the quote-unquote international community refers to none other than the U.S. and its allies, uh, it is a piece of information that has been shoved down the memory hole. And uh, oh, air traffic control records? What air traffic control records? And finally, on this timeline, August 21st, the bodies of many of the passengers flown to Malaysia. And uh, there are pictures of them online, including this one here on the video presentation that you're watching. Very stirring images of some of the uh, the coffin, the pallbearers bringing the coffins out from the plane, the transport plane, etc. So obviously all part of that propaganda rollout intended to stir the emotions and get people fired up for a war. But the question, of course, remains what really happened. And, well, there are two stories. There is the official story, and then there's the counter story. So let's look again at the official story, what we are expected to believe. <coughs> and this is the story, for example, that was propounded within the first couple of days of the actual attack taking place. On July 20th, John, Secretary of State John Kerry, the U.S. Secretary of State, of course, made the rounds of the Sunday morning talk show circuit. And on those uh, talk shows, he laid out what remains to this point, the official story, more or less, of what, uh, what occurred there or what we're expected to believe. He laid out several points in those talk show appearances, including the fact that, uh, quote, a few weeks ago, we have a 150 vehicle convoy coming from Russia going into the east of Ukraine with tanks, artillery, multiple rocket launchers, armed person armored personnel carriers and being turned over to the separatists. The implication, of course, being that the separatists suddenly had all of this military machinery that they were going to make use of, presumably by downing a civilian aircraft. Uh, he said they had an SA-11 right in the vicinity hours before this shoot, the SA-11 being a surface-to-air missile f uh, launched from, for example, a book missile launcher. Uh, he said the separatists have shot down 12 aircraft in the last couple of months, among them two transport planes, uh, AN-26s. Again, that well-documented, not really in dispute. Uh, I mean, literally, drunken separatist soldiers are piling bodies into trucks unceremoniously and disturbing the evidence and disturbing the pattern that is there. Anything that is removed, and we understand some aircraft parts have been removed, comp compromises the investigation. Again, trying to make it look like the crime scene is being tampered with in order to cover up what really occurred there. 9-11. <coughs> um, and uh, he noted, we observed by imagery that at the moment of the shootdown, we detected a launch from that area, i.e. the vicinity of the shootdown, and our trajectory shows that it went to the aircraft. Again, that's a direct quote from Secretary of State Kerry. Uh, we know with confidence, with confidence, that the Ukrainians did not have such a system anywhere near the vicinity, vicinity at such a point in at that point in time. Uh, we have not, within the administration, made a determination. I've tried cases on circumstantial evidence. It's powerful here, but there are an enormous array of facts that point at Russia's support for and involvement in this effort. Some of the separatist leaders are Russian. Russia has armed the separatists. Russia has supported the separatists. Russia has trained the separatists. All right, not really very difficult to parse what is being said here and what the implications of this are. Obviously, the State Department is trying to make it seem that it is Russia that was ultimately behind this because of their arming, training, supplying, funding, and directing of the separatists in eastern Ukraine. 
And that is basically the case. Now, the case is backed up by various pieces of evidence. Of course, Carrie referred there to imagery that shows the moment of the shootdown, including the detection of a launch from the area and plotting of the trajectory of that launch that seems to be going directly to the aircraft. But oddly enough, they haven't really showered the media with those images. What they've showered the media with is such things as the Ukrainian government's interception of phone calls uh, that was posted to the uh, to YouTube the day or two after the events, uh, in which you we presumably are listening to the voices of various people in the Ukrainian separatist uh, movement who presumably are talking about this downing of this aircraft and are presumably taking down uh, taking uh, uh, credit or blame for the, sh- the shoot down. We have just shot down a plane, Group Minera, so supposedly says voice of Igor Bezler. And this is these are recordings that have been vouched for by the State Department as being authentic. So again, take them for what they're worth. Uh, there was some question about the timestamp of the upload to YouTube and the idea that this had been uploaded the day before MH17. Uh, that timestamp um, has been debunked. That it's it's more to do with the way YouTube processes videos than it is to do with the actual upload date of the video itself. I'll put a link in the show notes so you can take a look at that. That was come that was a conclusion that we came to early on in the open source investigation at CorbettReport.com that the timestamps are inconclusive at best. And it would be a pretty shoddy job to upload your evidence uh, the day before the actual operation went down. That would be. A pretty ridiculous uh, mistake to be making anyway, so I think that's that's not exactly uh, evidence of anything. But the provenance of these phone calls and what they are actually uh, phone calls, recordings of, again, uh, there's uh, there's no, no end to what they could be or how they could be manipulated or tampered with or simply made up whole, from whole cloth. But then, of course, we have this damning conclusive evidence of a book missile launcher, which is clearly being driven by the separatists across the border back into Russia. I mean, how could this video that you're seeing on screen now in the video presentation be any clearer? That is so obviously the book missile launcher in question being driven across the Russian border. And how do we know this? Well, it was posted online, so it just it simply must be true. And we've been told that this is conclusive evidence. So apparently, again, that makes it true. This is the type of evidence that we've seen uh, being posted, along with supposed social media posts by the Ukraine separatists supposedly taking credit or taking blame for the shootdown, believing that they had took down a transport uh, plane, but then immediately backtracking on that. But again, all of this evidence that has been presented to us is not the type of telemetry or radar imagery or anything concrete as we had been told to believe that was uh, that was there that was on the way. It was uh, this type of evidence. But, uh, well, it's not exactly convincing. This amounts to, as has been pointed out in the press, by some of the press officers who actually are trying to hold some of these uh, minions to the fire, feet to the fire. Uh, This is basically social media. And the question is, is there anything other than social media evidence that we can actually point to that would actually indicate that this was the work of the separatists. And this was a question that was posed in so many words to the U.S. Secretary of State Deputy Spokesperson, uh, Deputy Spokesperson Harf, at a press conference on July 21st. How is it exactly that you know that it was fired from Russian, uh, I mean, from uh, separatist-held territory? Well, we have a great deal of information that the Secretary laid out yesterday, and I can go back through some of it today. Um, but uh, we do know, first, uh, that Russian-backed separatists uh, were in possession of an SA-11 system as early as Monday, July 14th. This is from intercepts of separatist communications posted on YouTube by the Ukrainian Well, is there government. anything, okay, is there anything other, because, you know, I can so, keep going so, if you, well, you want to Well, is there stuff that's in? other than social media that, that Yes, you're absolutely, about? there okay, is. so what is it that's other than social media? At this media? point, Matt, we've said uh, what our assessment is, very strong assessment publicly. If there's more information that that's based on that we can share, Uh, We're happy to do so. We'll continue looking at that. But look, this is what we know as of right now, based on open information, which is basically common sense, right? We know where it was fired from. We know who has this weapon. Well, I I don't know. Backed up. It's disputed, though. Backed up by uh, a host of information that we have gathered uh, about who uh, did this, where it came from, and what the weapon system was. So one of we're just telling you what we know now. Right, right. Well, isn't it interesting that what we know now seems to be based on social media and 
common sense, quote unquote. So let's compare that type of startling mustering of the facts and presentation of evidence by the U.S. State Department with that Russian press conference that we referred to earlier in the timeline in which they prevented, presented satellite and radar data to make their case for what actually occurred in the downing of MH17. Russian monitoring systems also registered that there was a Ukrainian Air Force jet, probably an Su-25 fighter, climbing and approaching the Malaysian passenger aircraft. The Su-25 was between three and five kilometers away from the Malaysian Airlines plane. The fighter jet is capable of reaching an altitude of 10,000 meters for short periods of time. Its standard armament includes R-60 air-to-air missiles, which are capable of locking and destroying targets within a range of 12 kilometers, and which are guaranteed to hit their target from a distance of 5 kilometers. What was a military aircraft? doing on a route intended for civilian planes, flying at almost the same time and the same altitude as a passenger airliner. We would like to receive an answer to this question. To corroborate this evidence, we have a video taken at the Regional Air Traffic Control Center in Rostov. At 17.21 and 35 seconds, with Boeing's velocity having dropped to 200 kilometers per hour, a new mark detecting an airborne object appears at the spot of the Boeing's destruction. The new airborne object was continuously detected for the duration of four minutes by the radar stations at Ustinetsk and Batuninskaya. An air traffic controller requested the characteristics of the new airborne object, but was unable to get any readings on its parameters, most likely due to the fact that the new aircraft was not equipped with a secondary surveillance radar transponder, which is distinctive feature of military aircraft. Detecting this airborne object at an earlier stage was not possible, since our radar sites normally monitor airspace in standard observation mode, which only enables aircraft detection at this range at an altitude of upwards of 5,000 meters. Detecting the new aircraft became possible as it started to ascend. Further changes in the airborne object's coordinates suggest that it was hovering above the Boeing 777 crash site, monitoring the situation. Ukrainian officials earlier claimed that there were no Ukrainian military aircraft in the area of the crash that day. As you can see, that is not true. Thank you. Well, of course, that's just a small segment of a much larger conference that included a, uh, a pretty interesting presentation in which they go point by point through the uh, the radar data that the Russians were working with. Uh, again, very interesting to take a look at that. And the ultimate conclusion of this, as they say, is that there was a Ukrainian military aircraft that was there on the scene uh, in the exact moments approaching the, uh, the end moments of MH17, and that did seem to be exactly on a course to, uh, to come up towards the, the aircraft, which, interestingly enough, one of the few details that we know for sure about the Ukrainian air traffic controllers, uh, 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 their, their, the way in which they were handling MH17, MH17 was flying at a regular cruising altitude of 35,000 feet, but was requested to lower down to 33,000 feet, which is interesting because, of course, the Su-25s uh, have a, a, a lower top altitude, and that's 33,000 feet brought it more more clearly in in within striking distance of that military aircraft. So, again, just another piece of the puzzle that lines up towards that presentation. And the question is, well, is there any cor corroborating evidence for this? Well, there certainly is. And some of this can be gleaned from a report that evidently was not meant to reach you or I, but has been preserved thanks to the miracle that is the internet. And uh, this is a report that was filed by BBC Russian correspondent Olga Ivshina on July 23rd and included some interesting eyewitness te testimony that you can see here on the screen uh, if you're watching the video presentation of this. I will uh, refrain from playing it because, of course, it is in Russian. But uh, but it indicates that these uh, eyewitnesses did witness a Ukrainian or a military aircraft. Uh, they did not specify Ukrainian, but a military aircraft that was uh, tracking and following the, the uh, civilian airliner before it was shot down. So, again, corroborating evidence from eyewitnesses that was then attempted to be scrubbed from the web by the BBC. Uh, according to BBC spokespeople, there was there were mistakes in the report. It didn't live up to the editorial values of the BBC, so they took it down. 
very interesting, and uh, I think we can make of that uh, that what we will. But uh, in terms of other corroborating evidence to the idea that there was air-to-air engagement of MH17 by military fighter aircraft, we have, of course, the images which by now I'm sure have become familiar to those in the alternative media where this has been made much of and not really so much in the MSM, the bullet holes in the fuselage. We've seen some of the pictures of these bullet holes. Here's one of them. There are more online. But the long and short of it is that, yes, there appeared to be entry and exit holes in the uh, in the fuselage that was recovered at the scene from, well, evidently, uh, either shrapnel, according to official reports, or military uh, uh, ammunition, i.e. 30 millimeter, millimeter caliber projectiles. So this comes from a number of sources. First of all, we get the uh, official investigators at the OSCE, <clears throat> the observers who were there on site to try to determine what took place with the downing of the aircraft. And the OSCE uh, had to admit on July 31st that they had no evidence um, that, uh, the, that, a, uh, that a missile was used to bring down the aircraft, but that they did have evidence um, in that they did find shrapnel-like holes, quote-unquote, in two separate places of the fuselage, uh, of the plane. They, the exact quote from one of the OSCE, OSCE group monitors, Michael Bocherkiev, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, he, he said, quote, it was shrapnel-like, almost machine gun-like holes. So that's the exact quote from the OSC observer, OSCE observer, and that was uh, corroborated by a German pilot who was uh, analyzing the, the takedown of MH17 and who said that the entry and exit holes uh, did, in fact, appear to be traces of shelling. So, uh, so again, it's uh, a very interesting further piece of the puzzle that, again, tends to indicate that the uh, Su-25s were in the area and did have something to do with the takedown, including actual use of machine guns uh, to, to bring down the aircraft, as amazing as that that seems to be for those who have been following the story from the mainstream perspective. But uh, in terms of more corroborating evidence, well, here's an interesting piece of that puzzle. Remember we talked about the black box and the examination of uh, the data in that flight recorder? Well, interestingly enough, the uh, results of that examination were eventually released on the 28th of July, but not because they were supposed to be released. We can pick this up from The Independent, which reported MH17 crash, black boxes show plane suffered massive explosive decompression following shrapnel hit. And remember, shrapnel seems to be the code word for the uh, bullet holes, which we are the, the whatever caused those bullet holes, i.e. the bullets that we were looking at in that previous picture. Well, this, uh, is, this uh, black box investigation shows that uh, that the decompression was caused by the shrapnel hit. So uh, this report reads, Flight MH17 was brought down by shrapnel that caused massive explosive decompression. Analysis of the black box recorders has found. The results given today by Ukrainian security official Andriy Lysenko have, however, left Dutch officials stunned as they did not expect the premature announcement. Mr. Lysenko told a news conference that the fragments had come from a rocket blast. His source, however, is under scrutiny after the Dutch safety board confirmed they did not give the information to Ukraine. DSB spokesperson Sarah Ven- Vernuij uh, told the Independent, I can't make a comment on what source Mr. Lysenko has. We don't want to confirm or say anything about the information on the black boxes right now. This is the best inf- in- This is in the best interest of the investigation itself. Blah, blah, blah. So it looks like the Ukrainian authorities spilled the beans on black box investigation and um and apparently it was an explosive decompression that was caused by shrapnel uh, fragments that had uh, punctured the aircraft again uh, we have to look at those bullet holes as being uh, the primary uh, a primary physical forensic evidence that at least we have access to in the general public at this point so I think they would have to present an alternative viewpoint or at least an alternative explanation for what those shrapnel uh, holes are and how they occurred. So again, a very interesting part of this story, but it just proceeds to get more and more bizarre the further down the rabbit hole we get. For example, we have the Twitter account of a Spanish national who was working in the Kiev air traffic control at Borispol, 
uh, a, a person who went by the Twitter handle at Spain Buca, but who has been identified online as Jose Carlos Barrios Sanchez. And he is someone who at first was questioned. It was it was uh, floated in certain websites that this was a fake Twitter account that had been created by someone in London, that it was just someone spoofing. It was eventually corroborated. In fact, this particular uh, person going by the name of Carlos had given multiple interviews, for example, on Spanish RT in the months prior to MH17, and those can be seen online. So this was definitely someone who was working at uh, Kiev Air Traffic Control. There is an interesting video that goes into some of the background of this uh, this person, which was uh, how it was identified as Jose Carlos Barrios Sanchez. I'll put that link in the show notes so you can take a look at that and the investigation they did, which tracks back his career to Washington, D.C., where he was working for something called the International Airlines Group. Again, very interesting uh, investigation there, but this is important because this Twitter account, at Spain Buca, which has since been removed, oddly enough, was tweeting in the minutes before the downing of MH17 and then shortly thereafter about how the plane was shot down, quote-unquote, the plane interestingly enough, quote, wasn't downed by a fighter, end quote, but that, quote, military have taken control of the air traffic control in Kiev, and, quote, before they remove my phone or they break my head, shot down by Kiev. And he repeats a few times, no accident, no accident, it was shot down. So, uh, again, we have this coming from someone who was working in air traffic control in Kiev, at the time of the downing of MH17. Again, this person has been verified as working at air traffic control in Kiev. Uh, But as far as I know, there have been no further updates as to the condition of Jose Carlos Barrios Sanchez or where he may be at this point. But at any rate, he was talking about how the military had taken control of air traffic control uh, uh, communications, which might be why we're not getting those air traffic control records that the Russians have been asking for, don't you think? Uh, Why have they been so reluctant to give those records? Well, here is one potential example of exactly why that is. So at Spain Buka, there is an interesting story. I suggest you look into it. Some of the, uh, well, the initial translation of his texts, of his tweets, was posted on a site called slavinigrad.org. Again, I'm pronouncing that wrong. But uh, I'll put the link to that in the show notes, as well as the link to a a translator who says that he is a Spanish translator, and he says that the translation that that has been widely duplicated online was a hastily put-together translation, and he put uh, out his own translation, which is slightly different, um, and seems to make more clear the fact that uh, Spain Buka was not referring to the idea that the Ukraine military aircraft had shot down the flight, but... Again, I'll let you examine that and make of it what you will in your own open source investigation, which, of course, is enabled and furthered by the Corbett Report resources that are in the show notes online. This is where things start to get even weirder, because, of course, there have been the speculation, well, what was, why another Boeing 777 from the same airliner as MH370 that went missing earlier this year, how, how is that possible? What are the odds of this occurring? There have been a lot of speculation about whether MH370 was swapped out for MH17 and whether they actually blew up MH370 and all of these types of speculations, but... One of the interesting parts of this are the bodies themselves, and there are some graphic imagery online of the bodies, and some images which have been uh, poured over by researchers. There's a couple of things to to say about the the issue of the bodies. One of them comes from an AP report from July 18th, (coughs) headlined with the leading title, uh, Rebel Leader Gives Bizarre Account of Plane Crash. And this story reads, quote, A top pro-Russian rebel commander in eastern Ukraine has given a bizarre version of events surrounding the Malaysian jetliner air crash, suggesting many of the victims may have died days before the plane took off. The pro-rebel website Ruskaya Vesna on Friday quoted Igor Gurkin as saying he was told by people at the crash site that, quote, a significant number of the bodies weren't fresh, adding that he was told they were drained of blood and reeked of decomposition. 
The Malaysia Airlines Boeing 777 was shot down Thursday, blah, blah, blah. U.S. intelligence said a surface-to-air missile, blah, blah, blah. Gherkin, also known as Strakov, and allegedly a former Russian military intelligence agent, says he couldn't confirm the information, but it's sure to add to the intense emotions surrounding the crash with the rebels accused of shooting down the plane. Gherkin said, Ukrainian authorities are capable of any biz- baseness. He claimed the large amount of blood serum and medications were found in the wreckage. Again, some interesting points there, not only on the bodies themselves, which according to some reports of what some of the eyewitnesses on the scene were saying had been drained of blood, were decomposing, were already dead before the crash, which is a bizarre idea. Um, But uh, how does that fit into the story of MH17? I think there are two things that are clear by this point. <coughs> One is that many of the passengers of MH17 were alive and well in the hours before the plane took off, which could be confirmed by multiple, many, many, many hundreds of, of witnesses and people who interacted with those passengers and family members, etc., who talked to them before they left and all those types of uh, ways of corroborating that these people were very much alive when that plane took off. And those people are very much dead now, Uh, again, with many of the bodies having been returned and uh, obviously not any of them having popped up and talked to any of their relatives or anything. So clearly they were alive before the plane took off and clearly they're dead now. So clearly people died uh, at some point. Um, And the question of why bodies would be scattered around, why dead bodies would be used as fakes to decoy in the event of a plane crash again it it doesn't make sense from an operational standpoint and uh and the types of speculation that have gone on about mh370 plane parts etc have been largely debunked i'll put links in the show notes for these types of speculations so you can look into them for yourselves as well as uh, there's been suggestions that some of the bodies themselves were not actual human beings but dummies and there are some images when examined closely uh certainly do appear to be mannequins or inflatable dummies of some sort uh they certainly do not appear to be actual human beings but the problem with this type of forensic analysis is that a um most people out there have not been exposed to this type of scene before so would not know what to expect in real life if it were to actually occur and secondly even if we could prove that certain of these photos had been staged that certainly doesn't mean that the event itself or everything surrounding it had been staged it means that certain photos Photos may have been staged. So, again, like the James Foley beheading video, which even now mainstream UK newspapers are reporting, was a staged video. They're saying that, well, yes, the video was staged, and clearly there are parts of it that have been edited, and it's not quite, it isn't real, but the beheading actually took place. Well, in the same way you could say, well, certain of these photos have been staged, but the crash actually took place. And I, I certainly think that the preponderance of evidence is that a Malaysian Airlines Boeing 777 did crash at that site. Um, I've seen the the speculation online about people saying that the crash evidence was placed there ahead of time or was uh, was actually taken to the site. I am not buying it. I don't think that's very conclusive. But again, I'll put in some of the uh, some of the the the, uh, the the pieces of this evidence so that you can go and check it out for yourself. All right, so that's the issue of the bodies. Another of the very interesting pieces of evidence is the passports. Uh, We've had these pictures that have popped up online of several of the passports that have been recovered, including boarding passes and, uh, and other information. Absolutely amazingly, these passports are in perfectly pristine condition, and uh, many of them seem to be hole-punched, meaning that they are expired or invalid passports. Um, what to make of this, other than the fact that this these pieces of evidence uh, seem to have been planted at the crime scene again? So, um, so, of course, this brings up all sorts of shades and echoes of 9-11, where, of course, we had the, uh, the, the hijackers' passports mysteriously floating out of the towers and down to the street level where they were picked up the very same day by the police as uh, part of the putting together of the puzzle pieces, including the flight uh, flight manuals and Korans that were found in the rented uh, cars of the, the alleged hijackers, etc. All of those nice pieces of the puzzle that came together right on the day of 9-11 itself just to make it all wrapped in a bow for the authorities investigating. And here we have these passports that are all grouped together in, in absolutely pristine condition. 
um, again, seems rather odd, as does the fact that, again, we've we've talked about the body spread out over 15 kilometers, a massive debris field, exactly like what we saw in uh, on 9-11 with the Shanksville uh, wreckage being spread out over several kilometers. But we're expected to believe that uh, uh, that the Shanksville plane came down all in one piece, all in one spot, but somehow or other the wreckage got strewn over several kilometers, when, of course, the preponderance of evidence again shows that uh, the Shanksville United Flight 93 was blown up over the site uh, by the U.S. Air Force that took it down. Again, there's lots of uh, testimony to that uh, extent. All right, so this is just, these are just some of the many, many pieces of this MH17 puzzle. The question, of course, is, as always, key bono. Who actually stands to benefit from what took place in eastern Ukraine? And I think that's the real way that we can get a handle on what went down there. Because, again, regardless of exactly how this plane went down, and despite the fact that the evidence at this point seems preponderously towards the side of uh, the idea that it was shot down by the Su-25s, rather than the fact that it was taken down by a surface-to-air missile launched by Russian separatists. Uh, the question, of course, is who benefits from this type of attack? And there are several different ways we can approach this. One of the most interesting is, of course, this incident occurred in a heavily contested area where there is active, intense fighting going on for control of the area, between separatist forces and the Ukrainian military. So obviously the Ukraine stands to benefit from having this little piece of, uh, of territory right in the middle of the action, which they gain access to, which becomes this international access zone where ceasefires are declared, etc., and uh, fighting can be uh, called off, at least for the time being, in a very strategic area where the fighting is taking place. <clears throat> But perhaps more, even more interestingly, and uh, perhaps a point that has been missed by many, this uh, downing of MH17 took place at a spot just south of a very important gas field, which is part of a $10 billion shale gas investment by Royal Dutch Shell. Uh, Royal Dutch Shell, of course, being based in the Netherlands, where MH17 originated from in, uh, in Amsterdam, where many of the passengers were Dutch citizens. And so Shell st stands to and stood to lose billions of dollars uh, based on the fact that the area in question, Donetsk, as well as some of the surrounding areas in eastern Ukraine, had voted in referendums in recent months to separate from Ukraine. Um, still, obviously, this is up in the air and very much contingent on what happens in terms of the way that the military confrontation between the Ukrainian government and the separatists plays out and or the way that the peace process between Russia and the Ukrainian government plays out. But there is a lot very much at stake on the table for Royal Dutch Shell that has literally, as I say, a $10 billion investment in what's happening there. And this uh, this has been reflected in the fact that we had, for example, the recent uh, report from Ria Novosti, Shell suspends shale gas production in eastern Ukraine over their conflict, uh, talking about how uh, Royal Dutch Shell has had to abandon their their uh, their operations for the time being. They cannot currently conduct drilling in this in this very important uh, shale gas uh, field that they've uh, sto staked uh, out the Uzivka field, but. Interestingly enough, they have declared force majeure on their contract, meaning that the contracts that they have signed for this, this multi-billion dollar investment are null and void for the duration of the emergency. So that as long as there is this type of emergency, the uh, Royal Dutch Shell are not on the hook for all of the money that they've promised for their various projects and contracts. So... Again, Royal Dutch Shell with a very important stake in this, and this plays out in some bizarre ways, including something called a capital repatriation uh, plan that, uh, that the Dutch government is undertaking right now, whereby they have declared the MH17 crash site to be an area where the Dutch government and Dutch citizens have an interest because they need to recover the property of the Dutch citizens that were on board MH17. And this has resulted in negotiations over the creation of a zone in which Dutch military would actually be placed at the MH17 site. So you are talking about the, the idea, at least right now, that's being kicked around of the idea of international military people uh, forces being brought into the region to protect and control the site, etc. Um, again, this was a few weeks ago, so I'm not sure what's, what's come of this uh, so far, but it is interesting that, again, this is taking place in a very strategic area for Royal Dutch Shell, 
who definitely stands to, if not benefit, at least not lose as much as they otherwise would if they can extricate themselves from their various investment obligations in the area. So something very much to keep in mind there and something that I think bears uh, further investigation is Royal Dutch Shell's uh, part to play in all of this and what the, the stake that they have in it. Obviously, some of the other things that eventuate from the MH17 uh, uh, crash are, of course, the U.S. finally managing to convince their European counterparts to tighten the sanctions on Russia, which did take place in the weeks after MH17. We did see that further tightening of sanctions, which, of course, resulted in the Russian counter sanctions, the food import bans. And uh, that escalation was very much brought about, or at least uh, lessened, the, uh, the, the opposition to those sanctions was lessened because of the MH17 incident, so that you even had uh, the, the Germans, who were very reluctant to apl- imply uh, further sanctions to Russia because of the damage they could do to their own economy, finally relenting in the wake of MH17 and admitting that this was just a terrible thing that had occurred and Russia had to pay a price. So they, the U.S. managed to get their, uh, their sanctions applied. Of course, NATO uh, steps one for, gets one step closer towards a, ca- a cases belli, the, uh, the idea that they have some sort of actual reason to be in Ukraine, if not directly because of the MH17 incident, which I think if this had come out as being, oh, this is clearly the Russian separatists, I think that NATO would have had some sort of international community agreement on some sort of incursion into the area. But at any rate, again, it brings us one step closer to that, and anything that increases the conflict or mayhem in Ukraine can be used by Poland to call on the mutual self-defense clause of the NATO treaty to say, oh, look, we're, we're under threat. We believe that Russia might roll right through Ukraine into us, and that means NATO would have to step in. So uh, that's actually been talked about and openly uh, floated in recent months. So again... A uh, very worrying situation in terms of what this means for potential NATO involvement in the region. And who is the other player that stands to benefit from what happened on July 17th, 2014? It's, of course, Israel, who began its uh, incursion into Gaza literally just hours after MH17 went down, so that the majority of the news cycle was dominated by the downing of the civilian aircraft and not the uh, bloodshed and mayhem that was taking place in Gaza. So you have all of these various interests that converge at the MH17 site. And I think just like a 9-11 or any other spectacular um, type of false flag incident, what you have in a situation like this is a number of different interests that come together at a certain point. And when there are enough competing and different interests that coalesce on one particular event, that event is much more likely to occur. The only people who do not stand to benefit from this in any way, shape, or form are, of course, the Russians and the Russian-backed separatists in eastern Ukraine, who obviously have absolutely nothing to gain by the downing of an aircraft, a civilian aircraft, Uh, There's just nothing on the table for them other than demonization and increasing sanctions and other such things, which, of course, is what ultimately happened as a result of this. So the idea that this is somehow Putin tenting his fingers, thinking, oh, how can I, you know, kill 298 uh, civilian passengers on an airplane is on its face ridiculous. And that isn't exactly what we're being told to believe. We're being told to believe, well, Russia is supporting the separatists. The separatists did this. They may have been crazy. It may have been a rogue faction. They may have made a mistake and believed it was a transport plane. Whatever the case, they did it. So it's Russia's fault. That's the the sort of the, the narrative when you actually dig down the official story. But of course, the narrative as it plays out in the headlines is Putin's missile. That's the extent of the uh, the analysis we're being fed. So I think at the end of the day, it's quite clear that MH17 was intended as a piece of propaganda in an escalation of the conflict in eastern Ukraine for a number of different competing interests, but um, they all converged at that MH17 crash site. And I think it's very clear that MH17, as that piece of propaganda that could be an open and shut case in the media, simply portrayed as, oh, clearly the Russian separatists did it, and therefore we can abandon, uh, we, we can just uh, abandon caution to the wind and just go and, and start m- m- rolling into Moscow, obviously did not play out in the way that it uh, was intended to. And that's exactly why MH17 is now nowhere to be found in the headlines. If you dig down and, and follow these stories, they are there, but unless you were actively following the MH17 story, it has all but disappeared, and you might as well, 
I mean, who who even remembers? I mean, obviously in the Netherlands and other places that were directly affected, it's still obviously a point of concern. But for most of the, the, the rest of the world, it's uh, long since left the 24-7 news cycle and therefore doesn't exist. Exactly like Libya no longer exists or MH370 or any of these other major stories that come and go through the headlines. So... Again, very interesting the way this propaganda piece played out and seemed to not only not work, but actually start to backfire with the revelation of the rad Russian radar data that indica indicated Ukrainian military uh, uh, involvement in the MH17 downing. So that's where things stand. And again, there's much more to be said and much many more different avenues to explore with MH17. Uh, and those uh, links to those types of investigations can be found at the open source investigation on CorbettReport.com. Of course, the link to that investigation is in the show notes at the very top of this uh, uh, podcast show notes so that you can go there and explore the 250 plus comments that have been left there in the last month. People just doing an excellent job of, uh, of examining this from every possible angle, and they are all accounted for in that comment section. This is just the overview to give you the uh, the rundown of MH17 and the way that it was intended to play out and versus the way it's actually playing out. The long and short of it is that 298 people are dead as the result of, um, well, I mean, the, the result of the geopolitical wrangling that's taking place in eastern Ukraine. Regardless of which side of the story you actually believe, it was the crisis in Ukraine that caused this, and obviously we have to look at what's going on there and hope that there can be some sort of resolution reached um, in the talks that are taking place as I record this in Germany between Ukraine and Russia. And, uh, and we have to see a de-escalation in, in these tensions because uh, the only possible alternative is outright military intervention, and that is not something that any of us want. And now, of course, the news cycle is spinning off into ISIS and ISIL and IS and whatever else you want to call it. So we're looking at another tinder uh, 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 ke powder keg that's looking to be ignited. And I'm sure after that there will be another powder keg somewhere in the world, perhaps here in the Asia-Pacific so we're running around fighting fires. Uh, obviously, that's not optimal, but it is something that we can do with this open source investigation. I invite you to check it out and to contribute to that open source investigation at CorbettReport.com. Finally, I'd also like to remind you, of course, that uh, the Federal Reserve documentary continues to do very well online. It has spread to hundreds of thousands of people, thanks to your support out there spreading the word about the documentary. And I am getting uh, media requests to talk about the documentary because you are out there putting in those requests and asking your hosts uh, to have me on to talk about this uh, this documentary. I really do appreciate that. It really does help to get the word out because, once again, the central banking fraud is the central fraud that underlies the entire military-industrial complex, which allows these wars to go ahead, which propagates the geopolitical conflicts. All of this goes back, back down to that monetary issue, so we have to confront that head-on. Um, your support with the Federal Reserve documentary is greatly appreciated. Once again, you can purchase your DVD copy at CorbettReport.com. That's going to do it for today's episode. Once again, I am very, very happy with the open source investigation community that is forming at the Corbett Report, and I thank all of the Corbett Report members for contributing to that and making it such an exciting time to be alive, to be able to confront the propaganda head-on in real time, deconstructing all of the lies even as they're put out. Um, it is truly a very empowering time to be alive, so let's make the most of it while we can. And on that very somber and serious note, I am James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, thanking you again for joining me for this edition of the podcast. Looking forward to talking to you again real soon. Yeah.